Low goes rogue. The RBA shocks the market yet again. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Insights, brought to you by Ainsley Bullion and the Gold and Silver Standard. Today, we welcome back Branko, who a week ago today, this this time last week, he was telling us about the potential for another bank collapse. Sure enough, it unfolded exactly as he predicted. So welcome back and um, congratulations on that call last week. Yeah, I mean, I guess you'd call me Houdini, but uh, it was a very <laughs> obvious call. So I don't know how much pride I take in that one. But, um, you know, here we are, another Wednesday, another bank collapse. It's, uh, yeah, just the normality at this point. Quite crazy. It really, you really did get all of that correct, though, because you're talking about, I know we were talking last week about this idea that, <laughs> Um, you know, it was likely to happen into the weekend and they like that extra time so they can find a buyer. And I was actually speaking with Alex about this on on Monday on Insights. And we were saying at that time when we were recording, they still hadn't announced JP Morgan was taking over at that point. It all really got stretched to the last minute. So it felt, felt to us like there was a lot of maybe not quite as smooth as they'd hoped behind the scenes going on there. It, it really just wasn't a a slam dunk sort of easy easy decision it was a lot of actual negotiations seemed to have to happen so it was, was a little bit different this time maybe yeah and i think we also talked about the, the structure of the deal which kind of is what happened where you know it was jp morgan a bigger bank coming in to save them but you also had that government kind of in the background where the government was kind of brokering the deal as well and i think that's what we'll talk about a bit later but that's kind of the um formula of what we'll see in the future of these bank collapses where you got the government in the background brokering the deal and then a bigger bank coming in to so I'm, I'm definitely keen to discuss more of that but first the article today you're actually talking about the rate decision that happened yesterday and i for one was caught off guard by that i know the market was caught off guard we were actually um, in the office obviously trading people buying gold and silver at the time and um, all of a sudden a big move in the price of gold um, out of nowhere because we weren't even usually watching rate decisions pretty closely, but we weren't because it was, it seemed like a pretty sure thing that it was just going to stay where it was, but that certainly didn't happen. So I suppose let's start off today. Was it a good or bad call to um, raise rates here? I think, you know, probably most people would, most people would agree a pretty bad call and the market definitely agreed. You know, the, the ASX finished down almost 1% for the day. Um, you know, nine out of 30 Bloomberg analysts, predicted this so probably about a 30 percent chance so definitely like what you were feeling it wasn't expected and then probably more importantly there's a big backlash at the moment with the public and the media towards philip Lowe, which i think is relatively justified so most people would agree bad call but for whatever reason the rba just just loves loves what they're doing yeah and i you know i was sort of having a bit put my conspiracy hat on a little bit um after this yesterday and i was wondering whether they were well aware that it wouldn't go down well, but prepared to do it anyway because they're worried that really we're coming to the end of what they can do because it seems that all of these rate rises are ultimately what's responsible for the collapsing banks. So it seems like the writing's on the wall and they're going to have to pause and pivot very soon um, where they may be just trying to give themselves a little bit more runway, a little bit more ammunition so that when they do have to pause and turn they can they've got several rate cuts they can make because they really didn't get that far like when you look look mm. at it in perspective the rates never got that high if this is the end of it that is an interesting point that i haven't had people make before i think that makes a lot of sense and that's probably one of the few ways that you could rationally justify lowe's decision i don't think you can say like oh he just mm. he's going to keep raising them forever because it's you know it's going to be too much pain but um it, yeah that is definitely a way that I think makes sense where most other ways to rationalize it really are quite difficult. So what was Lowe's actual defense of his decision there? Because, you know, the, the, the man on the street, the people I've spoken to can't really see how he could defend that. So what was his actual defense? Look, his defense was for whatever reason around probably, you know, ha house prices are going up and rents are going up. That was actually one of his main defenses. And then also he brought up like how unemployment was still, you know, going well and the employment market was strong so it could support further rate hikes. But as far as I'm concerned, they're lagging indicators, right? So it doesn't really show much of the current state of the economy. Um, and then the other thing I would add as well is we've actually seen economic growth go down, so they announced, right? So that shows that the inflation is actually working. We, 
So it went down from one and a half cent projection GDP growth this year to 1.25. So it shows the rate rises are working. And what he's basing his information on are kind of lagging indicators that show the opposite. So it doesn't make much sense in my mind. And that's such a good point because I've been reading some work on that as well around this idea of leading and lagging indicators. And they're all pretty much painting the same picture that we have hit that point where um, inflation has you know falls off a cliff effectively. Mm. We've hit that point where the growth slows, everything happens. Now, surely the Fed has access to an RBA in this situation, but you know we can make this argument across all central banks really. They have access to all of this information as much as any of us do, as much as we can look it up. So it just seems so odd to me that they're choosing to look at lagging indicators. I, the The thing I was looking at in particular was talking about what you just mentioned in in housing being the slowest lag of all. It had something along the order of um, over 12 months lag behind the actual economy. So you go, you can't really use that as, as yeah. an argument. You need to do something right now when the impact of that takes so long to be felt. We're probably only starting to feel the impact of some of the earlier rate rates <coughs> now on the slowest lag. So yeah, it's a it's a very messy um, way to run central bank policy, it seems. I completely agree. It doesn't make much sense. And um, it, you know, your actual thesis is is probably the only way that rationalizes it in my mind. I mean, their defense doesn't make any sense because they would have even more you know data than we would have on all this, and and that would probably only show what we're seeing. Absolutely. So, what what does this mean for the future of the Australian economy? Future of the global economy? Is this just an anomaly? um that we're out of whack you know we were really focusing on the fed um their decision i think uh tomorrow i think it is um and i was expecting maybe they have one more rate rise but they probably will come out with some language that says that's the end so it feels like we're right at the end of that australia then effectively like i said before saying we're, and, and in the article we might not be done yet so you know what what does it mean yeah, I mean, this, this is actually quite big news in the US because the RBA is like the first central bank every month to make their decisions. So often it can be almost a leading indicator for what other central banks do. Yep. So so it was a bit of chaos around what does this mean? And in my opinion, at least from their rhetoric perspective, they're, they're saying they're going to be raising rates you know, reasonably aggressively over the next few months because they don't have one priority is inflation. So... As far as what it, what it means for the Australian economy, buckle up because most likely rates are going to be rising. And then from a global economic perspective, you know, I don't want to say that we're the leaders because the Fed are the leaders, but, you know, it does contribute to the idea that globally we're going to see more rates as well, more, more yeah. rate hikes. So let's just turn back to the, the topic that um, you got so, did so well with last week. How does all of this tie in with what we've seen with First Republic collapsing um, and that subsequent bailout? Because it feels like this is all relevant and connected um, in some way. And I know you've been looking at this quite yep. closely. So how do you see it all fitting together? Yeah, so I think um, one of the key takeaways is, you know, so we're going to see, like we talked about, this continuation of this structure where the bigger bank saves the smaller bank with the government support. And that government support really is you know, most of the time going to be a form of kind of quantitative easing or the opposite of what rate rises do. Yep. So that's kind of the first point is that we're going to see this imbalancing act between government hikes rates. And then if a bank collapses, they simultaneously stimulate the economy. So um, in terms of a, a more global trend, funnily enough, I think we will see inflation not really be affected by debt rises partially for that reason. Um, and then in terms of uh, the future of banks like First Republic, actually, there's been a big collapse in some regional bank indexes lately. And so there's, there's a, a lot more concern around other regional banks could be affected by this. So also buckle up, we could see more similar sized regional banks in the US, um, you know, fall, fall similarly. And I've definitely seen um, that start already the talk of who's next and um, pointing out graphs and, and pointing out 
share prices falling dramatically on the next potential target. And that's that's what I see as the biggest issue here. We talked a little bit about this on Monday as well, this idea of contagion and whether just now, you know, we've had five happen in a row was the point that you're making <laughs> earlier in the week. Five banks fail. Um, and already that when you start to look at the actual collective um, value of all of that, it's significantly larger than what we had during the financial crisis. So it's already a major deal. But when you're in the middle of that and the solution is nowhere to be found because no one, like the RBA coming out and raising rates is the opposite of the solution that yeah. needs to happen, then you go, it, it's logical to just go looking for the next one. And looking for the next one in this situation causes the next one because, yep. you know, the, the, if your bank is the one that's in the radar, it, is everyone's talking about on Twitter is, oh, look how much that's fallen. That looks like it's going to be the next one to fall. You're not going to keep money there because you've already seen what happens and you're worried that next time maybe the, the government doesn't bail it out. You know, maybe I, I'm worried they run out of money, to be honest, that the, the insurance, uh, the FDIC, the insurance around this stuff just runs out. Now, it's so interesting to compare then? this to the crypto arena, which we saw with the FTX situation yep. as well, where we saw FTX went bust and then it was who's who next. And then we saw a run on you know, quite a few small and large um, companies, including a digital surge, which was I think the third or fourth highest uh, exchange in Australia, yep. who went bust as well. So it doesn't matter the asset, similar pattern, right? People panic, take their money out, one causes the other. And of course, you would think that there'd be a more of a safety net because the government's more likely to step in with banks than you know crypto exchanges. But I think you know at the end of the day, the taxpayer it's all it's all will be on the taxpayer's dime. Um, so it's, it's quite a worrying trend to say the least. Well, as per usual, Branko, you leave us on <laughs> concern for the future and volatility ahead. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that once more. Yeah, hopefully next week we get some good news, but. Yeah, he's not betting on it <laughs> <laughs> uh, love your work love uh, your work no all worries. right thanks everyone for watching remember reach out with those questions and comments um we do read all those and we appreciate your feedback uh that's us for today and and for this week um stay safe we'll be watching in the markets to see what happens with that next rate rise out of the us and what unfolds with this continuing uh, banking crisis because uh, as we've pointed out here here today uh it we would argue that we're not at the end. We're still somewhere yeah. in the middle. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So thank you for that again. We'll be back next week to see where we are. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'll talk to you then.